Hello, Real Life. Thanks for joining us for Church Online today. We're gonna have a great experience together. It's gonna include sharing some of the great worship moments we've had recently, so don't get nervous if you see a whole bunch of people on the screen. They're not really here in the building. Also, Pastor Chris is gonna bring us the final sermon in our ID series. And after that, we're gonna be sharing together in communion, so gather those elements. If you've prepared them, we'll look forward to that as well. All right, are you ready? Here we go.
I sure hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I want to let you know daily, your staff and leadership here are putting their heads together, finding ways that we can continue to be ministers of the gospel. And so I wanna remind you, on our website, you can find various ways that we're trying to help you. There you'll find a way that we can drive groceries or medicine to you if you are in need. We've got some great teenagers who are volunteering to go to homes of first responders and nurses and babysit kids. All of those things can be found online. Meanwhile, our children's ministry and our student ministries are providing all kinds of online content that they are just investing into the life of your family and your kids. And it's our privilege to be alongside you as we do these kind of things. We're going to continue to be here throughout all of this. If you call our church phone number and have a need, someone's gonna get with you and see how we can be a help to you. I also want to take a minute and say thank you so much for your generosity in these weeks that things are so different. It makes such a difference for us as we continue to minister together. You can see the ability to give both online as well as giving through texting here on the screen next to me. And so thank you for taking advantage of that even right now as we're not able to be passing the plates on location. All right, we're going back into service for another one of my absolute favorites. praise him because you know today that he is our advocate, that he is our righteousness, and you just need to say thank you for who you are. Maybe you need to do that as you sing, but maybe you just need to talk to God. Maybe you need to do it at your seat or at the altars or in the prayer room. We're going to sing that verse again. So let this be a cry of your heart this morning. He can give you rest. Let's sing that.
Welcome, Real Life. I am so excited that this week I'm going to be the one who's going to be preaching the Word of God to you. I'm Pastor Chris. I am the Spiritual Formation and Life Group's pastor here at Real Life, and I'm just so excited to come and just share God's Word with you. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for this time together. Lord, as your Word speaks to us, Lord, would you let this servant make much of you? But Lord, may your words go out through this technology, through the internet, through all the different mediums we're now streaming through, Lord, that your word would reach out into the masses, Lord, and hearts and minds will be changed. Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. This week's sermon is simply called, To Fight. Over the past few weeks, Pastor Todd and Pastor Mark have been leading us through the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. The concept of this message has been simple, though and throughout, which is simply this. Where do we find our identity? Where do we find our ID? The primary concept of that of finding our identity is then broken into two smaller questions, and those two smaller questions are simply this. Who am I? That's our identity. And then, why am I here uh, calling? Our identity is in our relationship with Jesus Christ. The identity is, is granted by our salvation in Christ than by the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within. Our calling those then define how we live in Christ and how we live out our purpose for our lives as Christ has commanded us to be. Last week, Pastor Todd spent a bunch of time talking about how we have to think differently from the world because the Spirit calls us to think differently than the world. Our identity and our calling are continually being expressed by the Holy Spirit that dwells within, pushing us to live in Christ, but also to live out for Christ. So there are two things I want you to understand today before we, we really get into the text and the scripture. It's simply these two things. Number one, knowing who we are in Jesus and knowing what our calling is in Christ is vital for us to live the fullest lives possible. And once we do that, there's a bigger picture beyond that, and that's simply this. However, knowing who we are in Jesus and knowing what our calling should be in Christ is also vital for us to show others how to live their lives to the fullest. However, here is the rub. When we are living out our identity and our calling in life, it's not simply a matter of just we can go do that. There is an enemy and the Bible's full of stories about this enemy who wants to take us down. There's an ever-present enemy who wants to ruin our lives. That enemy is simply the leader of the spiritual forces of darkness, and his name is Satan. The enemy has one task in mind, though. One simple task, to destroy you, to destroy me, to destroy every Christian in the world, ultimately trying to destroy the church. That enemy wants to challenge, to destroy, ruin our identity, our calling in Christ. Here, here are the stakes for this though. If he succeeds, then when we fail, we will live defeated lives. And when we live defeated lives and not triumphant lives in Christ, problems will happen. Though we have the ultimate leader in Jesus Christ, and who's also the ultimate warrior in a spiritual battle that we wage, and the one that we face, we must still face the enemy. We don't get a pass just because we have Jesus in our heart. We don't get to just walk away. We have to engage. However, the Bible, in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, Paul is writing and he gives the, the Ephesian church an understanding of how they can compete, how they can wage war, how they can survive the battle. And Paul writes these words in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. So if you want to, and you're in your houses, in your homes, wherever you may be, grab your Bibles and just open up to a book of Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 10, and we're going to break this passage down. And over the next few minutes, I'm going to give you two clear understandings of what this passage is about. So the first understanding is simply this. Know the identity of your enemy. Sun Tzu was the Chinese military strategist from the 5th century who wrote a bunch of different things about how to engage in the art of war. His classic book is called The Art of War. And he wrote these great words, and I want to share them with you this morning. If you know the enemy and know yourself, 
You need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Now that's not just simply a battle in the sense of war, a physical war. That means everything also, I believe, in the spiritual battle. However, the Apostle Paul, 500 years before Sun Tzu, wrote this passage in the book of Ephesians of how we should have the art of war. And Paul begins in verse 10 of chapter six. He says this, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that, you may, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. To begin any battle, we as Christians must recognize the need for the strength of God. And it's a strength that is beyond their own. That's why Paul references this God's mighty power. We find our identity in God's power. So what God decides to do for us is he wants to clothe us in his power. He wants to clothe us in his armor. The purpose of needing his power, though, is simply this. We must stand against the devil's schemes. Now, I was kind of doing a little bit of research here, and there's one commentary, and I love the way this particular commentary explains it. He says that Paul here is describing two distinct worlds from which this evil of Satan assails at us. The dark world that Paul writes about implies the world that we live in and the demonic forces that we experience in this world today. Those forces want to attack us spiritually, they attack us mentally. They tempt us, they try to possess us. Those forces, as I said a few minutes ago, are literally hell-bent on getting you and me to live defeated lives. The second world that the commentator was talking about is the world in the heavenly realms. Now in that world is an unseen war that we don't see the wages between good and evil. The crazy thing is the Satan can move between those two worlds. And that may scare some of you and that may make you a little worried. However, I want you to be reassured today. The forces of good that Christ commands can also move between these worlds. The enemy is not one that we fight alone, nor is it an an enemy that can even defeat Jesus. Listen to me, church. There isn't a spiritual enemy that's been created that we can face, that we will ever face, that can beat our Lord Jesus Christ. Not one single thing that the devil can do is going to beat Jesus. And if we stay in him and have our calling and our identity in Christ, we too have that power to overcome. However, Paul, like Sun Tzu, gives us explicit instruction to know not only who we are in Christ, but to know who our enemy is. Church, can I tell you something very simple today? There are many of us who just want to avoid understanding who the devil is, who Satan is, who these evil forces are. But we fall into a trap when we do that. We need to know who's trying to attack us and what they're trying to attack us with. We cannot win if we know neither nor only just one. We need to know who we are and we need to know who Satan is too. And when we engage in that battle... We need to know what the power of God and what the weapons of warfare that God has given to us. So number two is simply this. Know your spiritual weapons. The greatest fighters in the world are simply this. Ones who can defend themselves when attacked and then attack when they've finished done defending. Growing up as a kid, one of the things that I I learned to love was boxing. My dad loved it. My brothers loved it. And I grew up watching these tremendous fighters in the 70s and the 80s, and still to this day. And one of my favorite fights ever was between when Muhammad Ali defeated George Foreman for the boxing heavyweight championship of the world in Zaire in 1974. I was four years old at the time, but I remember my dad watching the TV and just being so excited about what he was watching. My dad was a huge uh, Muhammad Ali fan. We witnessed the greatest fighter of all time in Muhammad Ali, defeating arguably the most terrifying boxer of all time, George Foreman. You see, George Foreman was 40 and 0. 
He had 37 knockouts coming into the fight, and he exacted fear and trembling in everybody he faced. For a little bit more context, he was Mike Tyson before Mike Tyson came around. But can I tell you something? Muhammad Ali studied Foreman, and he came up with a great plan of defense and attack. Muhammad Ali knew himself, and he knew Foreman better than George Foreman knew himself. And the brilliant fight that it was, it's better been known and renamed as the Rumble in the Jungle. An aging Ali using a defensive tactic called Rope-A-Dope, which he, using this tactic, he was able to defeat the undefeatable in George Foreman. In the eighth round, George Foreman was worn down and beat down, and he had thrown everything he could at Muhammad Ali. And in that rope-a-dope, Ali took all the best shots the foreman could swing at him. But he defended and he blocked. George Foreman wore himself out in the heat of Zaire, throwing these powerful punches. But Ali just kept fending them off, fending them off. And he kept moving and he kept moving. George Foreman gave everything he had to Muhammad Ali. However, Ali knew how to overcome what seemed like the insurmountable challenge that was George Foreman. Church, in our lives, there are moments when we feel that we're in insurmountable challenges, whether they are spiritually, whether they are physical. They can really weigh us down. We're in, we're in experience right now in our world where we feel there are some insurmountable challenges. We have some fear, we have some trepidation of what's happening in our world currently. You know, those challenges come and there are temptations that are being thrown at us. Temptations which can ruin us. However, can I tell you this? Though Satan and his forces look like an undefeated George Foreman. It looked like that he's coming at you with giant ferocious punches and with destruction in their eyes. Can I tell you? You can be like Muhammad Ali. You can defeat the forces that are coming at you when you find your identity and calling in Christ Jesus. Pastor Todd and Pastor Mark have spent the last five weeks telling you that there is an identity that you have and that is in Christ Jesus. But there is even more, something even more important, a calling to your life. And when you know who you are and you know what you're here to do, when the devil comes at you like big George Foreman, you can fend him off. The Apostle Paul brilliantly then gives us the imagery of the whole armor and the weapons that, he, that the Bible tells us to live victorious in Christ. So if you continue along in your text in Ephesians chapter 6, 13 through 17, read what, listen to the words. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flame and arrows of the evil one. My favorite part of this text, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Notice how Paul in that beginning of that text reiterates one thing very quickly. We must put on that armor of God. Remember what I said earlier, God wants to clothe you in his power. Paul then kind of defines the day of evil, but I want to kind of point out something here. Paul uses the word when. He doesn't use the word possibly. He doesn't use the word if. He doesn't use the word maybe. He says when the day of evil comes. Because can I tell you, church, it's coming. If it hasn't already come to you, it's, already, it's coming. Don't you worry. Because when you live out your identity and you live out your calling, the devil's not going to sit there and just take that. He's going to come and try and wreak havoc and destroy. The Bible tells us that the devil prowls and he's looking to seek and destroy those who are in Christ. Paul tells us to stand our ground and do everything we can to stand our ground. 
The Christian is not supposed to become arrayed for battle and then sit at home cowering and stay away from the conflict. We need to follow through, church, and we need to strike a blow for the Lord. If you understand, I want to share this very simple understanding with you today. We cannot spend our time in preparation through prayer, through worship, through readings God's word, and living out our identity and calling just to be absent when the battle rages. We can't just put on the show of being Christians. We can't just come to church. We can't just pray, read our Bibles, and that's all good. There is a reality that we can't just step out of the fray. We can't get onto the sidelines. We have to come into the field of play, and we have to be in the battle constantly. You know, there are times in our life, and I have felt this, when we feel like Satan's like a Marine Corps drill instructor screaming in our ear, telling us how worthless we are, and and go ahead and quit, Christian, go ahead and quit. Like Gunnery Sergeant Hartman in the movie Full Metal Jacket, the devil's trying to pound us with profane and destructive words that destroy our identity and our calling. However, Paul, using the allegory of the Roman soldier's armor, gives us an illustration of how God clothes us to overcome even the fiercest attack. I want to break down that armor and that weaponry for you this morning. We must wear the belt of truth around our waist because we battle against an enemy who is a liar. I remember years ago, my wife used to take our kids to school and every day when they went to school they would go through this thing where they would put on the full armor of God and she would do this whole thing like, like she put on the belt of truth you know they put on the breastplate and we're going to get that and they do all this kind of like different motions but I wanted you to understand that, yeah that's a great thing to understand why we put these things on we must put on that belt of truth around our waist because we battle against an enemy who is a liar We must wear the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts against hatred and anger, for example. We must wear it. We can't just say we're going to, we've got to put it on. We must fit our feet with the gospel of peace so that all times where we're walking and when we're talking and where we're going, we're able to bring the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ will never find its voice unless someone proclaims it. Our identity and our calling for us, the church, is proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. In real life, we, always, we have this saying, right? Who are the ministers of the gospel? We are. That means we have the opportunity, every single one, it's not my job, it's always my job, it's not Pastor Todd, it's not Pastor Mark or Pastor Amy, it is all of our jobs to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Then we must take up the shield of faith, it says, to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Faith is simply the ability to prevail against the arrows of doubt. See, one of the the greatest weapons of the the, the enemy, of the devil, is to put doubt in your mind. Remember, he wants to wreck who you are. And one of the greatest ways is for you to end up doubting who God is, who Christ is, how the Spirit works in your life. We need to put on that shield so we can defend against those arrows. And then we must put on the helmet of salvation. Salvation is the thing that sets us free from sin and death. The helmet of salvation protects us from death and hopelessness, and it protects us from temptation. Salvation in Christ delivers us from death, brings hope to our lives, and gives us the ability to overcome that temptation. You'll understand this. Our brain, when it thinks, our body will enact. Whatever you think, your body will do. Therefore, the helmet of salvation reminds us of our identity in Christ and our calling in Christ. The, uh, the helmet literally keeps us focused on who Jesus is. The last part of the armor, though, is not actually armor. It's actually a weapon. A weapon of war that finds effectiveness both defensively and offensively. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. A weapon used by Jesus himself to defend and attack Satan. 
When Jesus was experiencing temptation in the world, as he was coming into his ministry, Satan tries to attack him with all these different things and tries to tempt him. And Jesus, using the words of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, repels the devil. Because you know why? Because Jesus knows who he is. He knows the liar that he is. He knows what his, his game was. He knows what his temptations were. And Jesus used the word of God. He used the word of God to send the devil packing. Just like Jesus against Satan, just like Ali against Foreman, we become the greatest fighter when we have both good defense and good offense, which is what the word of God gives to us. The Bible tells us that the word of God is like a double-edged sword. It goes in and out. Understand, church, the word of God is our best offense and defense against what Satan wants to throw at us. We cannot win the spiritual battle if we don't know the word of God. You know, we live in some strange times where a virus is attacking every facet of our life. The coronavirus seems to be consuming all of us and the effect it's having on all our lives. This virus is not a weapon of darkness formed by Satan to bring us down. The coronavirus is a naturally occurring virus that unfortunately jumped from an animal to humans. This isn't the first virus to do it. And to be honest with you, it's probably not going to be the last. However, this virus, I believe, is being used by Satan to distract us from God, to distract us from our true identity and our calling in Christ. It's causing us to be hopeless. It's causing us to be fearful. It's causing us to be angry. It's causing us not to be the church of Jesus Christ. We see the spiritual forces of darkness act out in fear and panic and hopelessness and anxiety. And it reigns all over our news feeds and in our communities and our conversations at times. You see, we cannot be those people. We must be people of courage and wisdom and strength and faith. We must put on the full armor of God. You know why? So we, we can be the leaders in our community. We can be the light to the world. We can be the church of Jesus Christ in this crazy world that we live in. Where there are lies, we must be truth. Where there is anger and hatred, we must be the breastplate of righteousness. Where there is no hope, no joy, no love, we must be the gospel of peace. Where there is doubt and fear, we must be the shield of faith. And where there is sin and temptation, we must be the helmet of salvation. And finally though, where the spiritual forces of darkness try to destroy us. We must wield the word of God against those forces. Now is the time and the season where the church of Jesus Christ needs to live out its true identity and live out its true calling. This is the time and the season where the church of Jesus Christ needs to show the world where their true identity and their true calling comes from. It comes from the same person and his name is Jesus Christ. Church, we are called and identified for such a time as this. Let us live it out. Let's live out our ID in this world today. Would you pray with me? Lord, we just thank you and we praise you. God, we would love for you just to empower us right here as we sit in our rooms as we sit in our living rooms with our families or wherever it is that we may be. God, we want to be ready for the fight. We want to be ready for the battle. Lord, we want to know our enemy, Lord, but we want to know who we are and what our calling is. So Lord, would you let your spirit fall afresh upon us right now. Lord, that we may put on the armor of God. Lord, that we will be clothed and ready for the fight. And Lord, would you encourage us to step in, to step into this world and tell the world 
that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And God, we will give you praise and give you honor. And Lord, we will fight. We will fight. And we will fight in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, amen. In response to what Pastor Chris just shared with us, we're now gonna enter into a very sacred time of communion together as a church. And so I'm gonna give you just a moment if you need to pause the live stream to gather people together or to settle in, perhaps to grab the elements, and then we'll take together. Throughout the history of the church, we have followed up on Jesus' command that whenever we gathered together, we were going to remember what he did for us when he gave his life at Calvary. And the church has done that through the years, not just gathered inside of a church building, not just inside of even homes where they gathered, but they have done this together in the most uncertain of circumstances and times. They have taken communion out to the prisons. They've taken it into the leper colonies where no one else would dare go. And there they have shared the beauty of God's love for them. And so today, we're going to share this beautiful sacrament right inside of each of our individual homes together. We're remembering that on that Passover night, Jesus met with his disciples. He took two very familiar elements, the bread and the cup, and gave them brand new meaning. First of all, he took the bread. He broke it and gave it to each of them Right now there in the room, take a moment to pass the bread around each person who is there. As the disciples held the bread in their hands, Jesus said to them, from now on going forward, this bread represents my body that is broken for you. Jesus knew what they didn't that the very next day in his body, he would take the beating of the whips and the, and the crown of thorns on his head. He would even take the nails into his hands and feet, that he would die and give his life, that they might have salvation. It's that that we are remembering today. So take and eat with grateful hearts. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. What you did was so difficult. You took onto yourself what we deserved. Lord, the prophet said about you that you took a punishment that was supposed to be laid on us. You did it because of your great love for us and you did it because this was the only way that we would know eternal life. So thank you, thank you, Lord, for that. We ask in your name. After he had taken the bread, he also took the cup. Once again, he divided it amongst them, and so go ahead and pass the cups around in your room right now. As they were taking the cup, he told them that this represented a brand new covenant between God and man. No longer would it require the annual sacrifice of lambs to temporary cover over sin. But now sin was going to be gone forever, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ himself. It must have blown their minds to realize the brand new promise that God was making to give them eternal life, a promise that we receive as well today. And so take and drink with grateful hearts. Lord, we thank you for your blood that has been shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. And this day, once again, we remember what you've done for us. Lord, we know that until you come again, 
we will share in this remembrance over and over again because we never get tired of remembering that you are our way to eternal life. And Jesus, one day when we walk into heaven with you, we will sit around the table and once again we'll celebrate that we have been made whole by the blood of the Lamb and have been granted entrance into eternal life because of what you did for us by your shed blood. And for that today, right here in our homes, we say thank you to you and we give you the praise you deserve. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior. Amen. God bless you, real life. Thank you, church, for joining us this special time. We'll see you next week.